All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 31 of Write the Docs podcast. It's great to have you here, and we've got a uh, full show today for you. Uh, so without further ado, let's introduce the regulars, and then we'll get into what's going on. So first of all, welcome to the show from the West Coast of the US, Tom Johnson. How are you? Um, I'm doing all right. Uh, this is... My- I'm kind of weirded out by this virtual background, but uh, I think I'll get used to it. So this yeah. is the latest. This is the latest I've ever joined here, and it's at 11 p.m. And I feel like a very old, old man here because I'm like half asleep. But hopefully, I'll stay awake. <laughs> it's all right. Hopefully, the hopefully the conversation will wake you up again. Then the problem is you probably won't be able to go back to sleep again. <laughs> and uh, of course, joining us from um, sunny Berlin is Chris Ward. How are you? It's not so sunny today. I'm good. Oh. I overslept, so I just woke up. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning. Welcome to so, the day. I'm usually in Tom's position. And actually, I was uh, on a call uh, yesterday with someone who said, oh, I love the, the podcast you do with the, right, the Docs people. You're always the right mix of tired and grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually like a feature. Personally. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, as I suggested before, we've got a bit of a, an interesting show today. And the, the topic of the show today is all about search. And, you know, Chris and Tom and I, we've been around the traps a while for uh, as technical writers, but, you know, the ins and outs of search is something that a lot of technical writers have a bit of trouble getting their heads around often. So I thought I'd... Um, bring in someone who knows a little bit about search and that is uh, Peter Levin uh, from Funnelback. How are you, Peter? Hi everybody. Um, yeah, no, no, it's uh, good. It's end of a long week, but uh, no, ready to, to get stuck into and, and hopefully um, provide some useful uh, tips for you guys when you're, when you're developing your, um, your, your docs. And search and all that sort of stuff. Well, look, what, yes. first, what we normally do is when we have a guest on the show, we um, we uh, ask you to tell us a bit about yourself. So, uh, how about you start uh, off by saying, well, how we know each other because we sort of do know each other a bit, don't we? Yes, yeah. So um, Jared and I both are part of the documentation team at Squiz. Um, I'm actually working for um, well. Um, I, I write the documentation for Funnelback, which is um, Squiz's search engine product. Um, but um, and I've been I've been I've been working at Squiz. I started in in the UK in two thousand and nine, so I've been using Funnelback for a while. Um, yeah, Jared Jared and I write all of the documentation for um, Squiz's suite of products. Along with Giles, who is also a friend of the show. We've had Giles on before yes. talking about stuff as well. So it's a bit of a, a squeeze affair now. We've all, all three of us are on here now. So we, the trifecta is complete. <laughs> so, uh, Peter, the, the thing that I was talking to you about when I wanted to get you on the show is that I know that so many um, documentation websites just rely on search. Everyone sort of expects it as like a first class citizen on websites now. But it's, it's often a bit of a mystical thing or when you start to dive into it more, it, it sort of, it feels sometimes a little bit overwhelming to get search right and understand yeah. what the really important things of search are. So yeah. what I wanted to talk about today with everyone on the, on the panel today is a bit more, go into a few details about the ins and outs of search and, and think about the things that are like, almost like the things that you can't not think about when you're actually wanting to implement search. Um, so sure. I guess we should start at the beginning, which is, um, you know, Google does search. Why can't we just use Google to index our doc sites and, and manage it all for us? You know? Well, um, you certainly can use Google for that. If, if that's what you want to, um, Google obviously does a really good job of search. Um, and that's why everybody uses it. Um, um, but there are some, um, limitations from using a search engine like Google. Um, so Google have a, an offering called Google Custom, which allows you to um, use your, um, your content from within the Google search index uh, to deploy a search on your website. 
um, and that is that search then just searches over the, the documents that, that form part of your your set of um, your set of pages so maybe that would be your search domain usually one of the big disadvantages of using a search engine like Google is that you just have no control over when and how frequently your content is updated you're totally at Google's um, whim on that it might be a day it might be a month before your content appears in the Google index um, and there's nothing at all that you can do to change that. Um, the other large area, I guess, is that um, you've got a lot less control over what you can do with your search. So um, Google Custom gives you some very basic um, customization um, options. You can do things like add a header and footer uh, to kind of try and sort of brand it to match your site but beyond that there's not a whole lot that you can do um, so if you want to start using more advanced functionality within your search or making use of some of the things that we're going to talk about a bit later mm. um, it's just not really an option with a free service like google um, but having said that um, using something like google is is definitely a much better thing to do than not having a search at all um, um, searchability and discoverability of content um, is goes hand in hand with all of the sort of best practice stuff that that we do on a day to day basis when it comes to actually writing the content um, and um, having a bit of an understanding about how people interact with your documentation when when they run a search um, does have some sort of um, it will have a bit of an impact um, on how you write your content as well because you have to keep in mind that um, uh, people can come in, from a search engine, people can come into your content from anywhere in your mm. site. It doesn't matter how deep it is. So you've got to make that, that work and make that experience make sense. So for example, if you take a, a large document and break it into um, down into chapters and sections within those chapters and, and you kind of design it in such a way that you're meant to read through it from start to finish and kind of follow this process through, what happens when you jump in at page 32 of that? with no context around that, uh, are people going to sort of understand what's going on? So there's a lot of um, other things that you do need to think about um, when you're even just designing your sort of basic sort of content. Right. So I you're don't saying know that... Uh, go go ahead, ahead, supplemental question. Um, I just wondered because when, when I saw this question, there was a little bit of me that was thinking, is that even still an option? Because it used to be that the simple search was, you saw it everywhere. And now you hardly see it at all. <laughs> and I was actually even quite surprised that it was even still an option. Um, but I, you do still see it, so occasionally. So do you think people sort of stopped using it because of some of the reasons you outlined or just because there's better options now? Or, yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, I don't, I don't quite understand the question. So, I mean, search just, is... Just in, the, in the, the Google simple search, like site search, that you could add to, to, to websites. You used to see it a lot more and now you see it a lot less. And I just, oh. if, if there was another reason apart from some of the reasons you outlined, or just now we have other options, which we will cover. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's not really something that I, I wasn't particularly aware that, that there was less usage of, of okay. services. Like, Maybe like just Google. the site. <laughs> I wonder if it's got something to do with like a lot of, well, a lot of sites, like you say, Chris, there's probably at, at one point, maybe early on in the web, um, when people were starting to think about, you know, embedding search on sites and stuff like that, you know, custom search was a, was probably an easy option to do when there probably wasn't a lot of search tools out there that were a affordable or free in a lot of cases, um, or, you know, sort of easy enough to set up. And I think from what Peter tells me, it, it sort of seems relatively simple to set up a Google, uh, a Google um, a custom search whether that's a good thing or not is another thing to sort of think about, but you know, it's still um, an interesting sort of um, idea as to why I know that I think Labrokes, when I was working at Labrokes, they had on a certain part of their site, they had a custom search, a Google custom search embedded in there just to search on this. I think it was a terms and conditions page. So they just narrowed it down to this one thing. And it <laughs> probably had a lot to do with the fact that the, the terms and conditions page was pretty hard to navigate. So you needed something <laughs> in there, at least something that you could actually use to, 
to sort of I, make I think your we way should probably it. explain to people who don't know what Ladbrokes is and why that agency. might have been important. <laughs> yeah. It was it was a bidding agency. It was their, their bidding terms and conditions. It was a it was a mammoth mammoth wall of text. <laughs> so yeah, that, I mean that well, is an example of where something really simple like that. If you don't need search on any other part of your site except for that little bit, then maybe that's oh. a time when Google um, Custom might fit in. Um, yeah, look, like, I mean, oh, I was just going to say, I think it, um, having search is something that uh, we probably should all be kind of striving to have because it's kind of one of those things that people just expect um, that, that you'll have. Um, people are... Um, certainly the last few years have really um, shortened people's attention spans and everything. And they expect to find information sort of instantly um, with very little sort of, you know, put, putting a one word query in and I'm going to find exactly the page that I want in some enormous website <laughs> and, you know, search engines like Google um, funnel back and, you know, all of these other search engines, they've had to become quite smart at how they deal with that sort of thing. Um, so it's, it's just kind of one of those services that we should be providing, especially given that it's not very hard to do. Yeah, I guess there are a whole yeah. lot more options out there now. So if you think about the options outside of something as basic as Google, um, Google Custom, what do you start to get into when you're trying to work out what search engine to maybe pick for the, the job that you're trying to do? Because it seems like at the moment in the marketplace, there's there's plenty to choose from, and I think yeah. in a lot of places that's that's often where people get a bit overwhelmed with with going. Well, mm. what do I do? Where do I start? You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think actually starting, if you really don't know, starting with something like Google Custom is a great way to go because it, it introduces you and gives you a basic level of searchability of your content. Mm. Um, going beyond that, um, there are some free search engines around that you can install. Um, um, there's things like Elasticsearch. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. There, there, there are a, a, certainly a bunch of, of free tools that are out there. Um, and then you, you obviously move up from that into to starting to go into the paid, the paid for tools, um, funnel back of which is one of those. Um, so it really kind of comes down to a number of things, I guess, one of which is how technically proficient are you and how much time do you want to invest in putting together a search? So something like Google custom, you can deploy very quickly um, with relatively little skill. Um, most of the um, free search engines that are around, especially the more fully featured ones require quite a lot of work to configure. So you do need quite a bit of technical expertise to actually get in and set these things up. Um, but if you do have that and you've got the time to invest in that, you can come up with something that's pretty good. Um, and what the paid for services tend to do is they tend to give you um, the ease of use plus the, you know, the, the real control over, over, over your search. Um, so, you know, whether that comes down to, you know, picking the different um, front end sort of search features you want to enable um, or configuring how frequently things get updated, all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, so yeah, it, it does, the decision really does come down to, I guess, what you want to get from your search. Um, the other thing to consider too is how large your site is. Um, if you have a very, very small site, you're not going to get a huge amount of benefit from putting a search on top of it. Um, so it, it's, yeah, it's, it's just about really making that sort of evaluation. What do you think um, on the subject of small site? I know sometimes it's hard to put a, a number on things, but if you if you're talking like pages, which I'd imagine is what a search engine's probably mostly focused on, uh, as far as like what it thinks is a, a large or small site, what's what's sort of like a small site to you? What would you call that? So I'd probably call a small site. That, that, it, it is a little it is a little bit of a tricky question because mm. um, if you, a small site could just be you know two pages but those pages are really big. I mean, give, having said that, a search engine is not going to help you very much because if you can only get two search results back, um, you're still going to have to find where within those pages the the relevant bits of content are. Um, I'd probably consider a small site anything up up to I don't know fifty hundred pages something like that. Okay, so 50 um, to 100. You know, you've raised um, an interesting awesome. point there about 
site size and page size because you were saying just before um when you're talking about quality results it depends on how the contents chunked down a little bit too and how many individual or unique pages a, an engine can find by the sound of things um tom do you have um you've got a fairly large site being you know your um your blog site have you, have you got search on your site yeah, actually, uh, probably three years ago, somebody from Algolia um, was like, hey, we'll give you free Algolia search uh, as long as um, in the search results, we have this little Algolia image. I was like, fine. Um, so I've, I've kind of been playing around with it. And it's interesting, uh, the algorithm that Algolia takes, um, they actually, you, you you tell it which elements that you want to index. So it's not like you just feed it a bunch of pages to index. It actually like breaks up each element on the page and indexes that separately. Every paragraph element, for example, or however granular you want to get it. And that then makes it so that each element is like uh, searched. Um, I guess if you were to just search the, the whole page, it's like not nearly as efficient. Uh, some people like this approach. Other people yeah. don't like it. It's very weird because like you think, oh, let me just index everything. I'm going to index my code blocks. I'm going to index my block quotes, my list items, my head, everything. Uh, and when you do that, though, um, it often like <clears throat> creates these huge record sizes that then like give you errors and stuff. So it's it's tricky to try to try to adjust. Um, but one thing about Algolia that I think is very, has a very strong uh, appeal is the instant results. Um, the ability to type and kind of see what's returning right in the same instant that you're typing feels very modern. Um, whereas other search engines where you have to like do the full query, hit enter, and then see what comes back, and then adjust your query, that's not nearly as like gratifying as the instant search. Yeah, so instant search is obviously great, and um, most search engines actually employ a bit of a combination of the the two. So, um, I mean, just looking at Google's public search, when you start typing a, a search, you'll start getting a um, a set of um, um, suggestions being returned. Um, some search engines also allow you to kind of tailor a bit more um, what those suggestions look like. So, you know, you might, for example, if you're searching like a staff directory or something, actually get um, items coming back that show there's the staff members photo and and sort of these rich sort of snippets coming back in those sort of suggestions as well um, and that sort of moves all the way to sort of full-blown um, sort of instant search so um, what Algolia does is kind of gives you that auto completion but in a fairly small little block in the corner of your screen that's typically how I've seen it anyway rather than actually updating the whole sort of page of search results um, but both both sorts of things are certainly possible. Um, and yep. then you mean you can, sorry. Oh no, sorry, keep going. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's certainly possible to, to implement um, a sort of instant search with a lot of the sort of other search engine products that are around there. Um, your point um, that you mentioned about sort of um, chunking uh, about this, uh, uh, um, you know, throwing everything into the search. Uh, that's actually a really good point. Um, if you actually want to get really good quality from your search results, it's really important to kind of think about what what is actually going to constitute a useful for, useful uh, search result for your users. So you don't want to actually index everything because otherwise you kind of get this situation of garbage in, garbage out. There's so much noise in the search results that you can't actually find the thing that you're looking for. Um, and then when you actually sit down and take a much closer look at it, you find, well, actually, I don't need half these items in the search results because they don't actually provide any useful content. Um, so for something like a, um, like a documentation site or, or just like a typical sort of website, um, it's often a good idea to actually um, not index your landing pages because they just duplicate the content, actually what you, what people want to find at the content pages. Um, so, uh, taking a blog, for example, you wouldn't want to index the main page of the blog. You want to index the individual articles because whatever you search for on that site is going to return the homepage because that lists everything. Um, or if you 
you know, take a typical sort of um, organizational website, um, you, you want to hide the headers and footers from the search engine if you can, because if somebody searches for contact, it's going to return every single page on the site because it happens to be in the site navigation. Hmm. Um, so there's these little things that you can do to make your user's life a lot, a lot better. Um, and thinking a lot about what constitutes good content in uh, to actually include in the index is, uh, is probably the biggest thing that you can do to improve your search results. Hey, hey Peter, I have a question for you. Um, so, so this is leads, perfectly into this big sort of conundrum I ran into when I was investigating search uh, a couple months ago. Uh, in our developer portal, there's documentation, there's a blog, there's forums, and then there are marketing pages. And currently we have like a search that searches, searches across everything but the forums. It uses cloud search. It's not very exciting. And we've been looking for a replacement and I was researching different tools and sort of came to the conclusion that if I wanted to have a really good search, I needed structured uh, content in there. Like I needed to have specific sort of uh, tags that I was using for different purposes. So my question was this, should I scope the search to just be docs? Because those are, that's the only part that I can actually control and I can highly refine the metadata that I'm feeding it. I can kind of prune the results. I can fine tune it. On the other hand, the results won't include a lot of other content that mm. might be relevant. But if I expand the scope and include all these other domains, the blog, the forums, the marketing pages, I can't control the metadata. I can't say, hey, you gotta like tag them this way. It's gonna be a lot of stuff like blog posts from, I don't know, five years ago that are no longer relevant that I'll have to try mm. to like bury. Uh, old forum threads that are just optimized for certain keywords, but aren't actually relevant. Like, is it better to just have a really narrow scope on just docs or should I really try to have a site search that is comprehensive of the site? That is a, that is a tricky question and it does depend a lot on your users. Um, I mean, a lot of search engines actually give you some tools to kind of give you the best of both worlds. So we were talking about Google custom being a very basic search. As you start to move into some of the other search tools that are out there, um, you can do things like set up filters on the search results. So if you search something like eBay, for example, or amazon.com, you'll find on the left hand side, there's a whole bunch of options that you can click on to start um, filtering down the set of search results. So for a site like um, you were just talking about, um, you might have a filter, for example, there that says, I just want to restrict it. I don't want to see the forum posts. I'm going to untick that box. Or, or um, look, I just want to, I'm just interested in the documentation items that are in there. And then you click the documentation button. Um, now, you do need some form of structured data to inform that. But the structured data might be something as simple as what is the domain name? Um, so the, the, you know, the domain name is a, is a form of metadata, if you, if you will. Um, but I guess the level of functionality there is going to depend on the search tool that you're using um, and whether or not you can sort of set up this kind of thing. Yeah, um, the, the, the facets are something that I've always been intrigued by, like mm -hmm. having a bunch of, you know, facets for documentation that would indicate like, hey, what product are you searching? What uh, version? Um, I don't know, recency, popularity, but as you say, like you've got, you've got to have everybody on board with the same kind of facets and they have to tag something. I mean, you could try to drive it from the URL, but that assumes your URL has that kind of information. And in my it's case, it doesn't really. So it's like, it's kind of a lost cause. And that's why I didn't even want to try to include those other domains in the search because I knew that I couldn't do any filters with them. Yeah, so for something like that, um, if you do have the ability to kind of set up basic faceting on the on the URLs, uh, you could base, you could set up a top level one that just allows you to do that kind of restriction where you can knock out all of the forum posts and knock out all of the blog posts. Um, and you could still then have facets that relate to the documentation part because that's probably the more important bit anyway. Um, so that when you actually start to drill down into the documentation, you can still have that sort of um, functionality across the, you know, across that just applies to the documentation. Um, as to whether or not you include things like the marketing sections or the blog posts or those sorts of things, I mean, that really comes down to, I think, whether or not you think that that content 
is valuable um, for your customers and whether the trade-off of including it in there um, is, is I, I guess, a positive when you compare it to the, the um, you know, the increased difficulty in potentially in finding some of the other things. Um, I mean, there's also a lot of other things um, in search engine ranking algorithms that can, that can often sort of overcome some of those problems. So search engines, for example, will take into account the age of a page. Um, there's a lot of actually things that come into the ranking algorithm that it uses to determine what is actually a good result. Um, and some, some of those things that you can influence by how you write your content as well. Um, but uh, some search engines also allow you to go and sort of pull, pull little levers and tweak those settings to say, you know, I want content from the doc site to be actually be seen as more important. So I want to push up those results relative to something from the marketing side. I want to push that right down. Um, and that doesn't mean you're not going to see marketing results because maybe the word that you search for is only in a marketing result, but it means that given everything else is the same, the docs one will rank higher than the marketing one. So it, it's kind of a complex problem and um, I don't think there's necessarily a right answer for it. Um, and it's going to obviously, uh, it's going to obviously vary a lot from site to site. Um, and I think it really comes down to the content at the end of the day. Hey, so yeah, speaking, speaking of the algorithms, I just wanted to throw something else in here. Uh, there's another search engine that um, actually AWS just released called Kendra. I had never heard of it, but it tries to incorporate machine learning algorithms to allow like users to sort of uh, upvote or downvote different results that will then like inform the, the results that are shown in the future. Um, yep. and I, I don't know how well it works, to be honest. I think uh, AWS implemented it implemented this on their site, replacing cloud search about two months ago. Um, so it's still kind of early to see if it's had any impact, but the idea of incorporating machine learning into search seems like a natural fit. Um, I don't know that much about machine learning, but I think like this is an area that it's, that is ripe to uh, take advantage of it because uh, I don't want to be in the business of manually adjusting all the levers of search myself, right? Trying to figure out, well, let me figure out what the user's location is and then I'm gonna optimize this con. No, it's like, that's too much. Uh, uh, so yeah, have you, have you kind of explored any kind of search engines that have machine learning algorithms informing? Yeah, so I, I guess the first thing is it really depends on what your definition of machine learning is. Um, what you're talking about there is actually <laughs> quite similar. No, what you're talking about there is quite similar to a feature that actually exists within Funnelback um, where um, users clicks on results um, will over time influence the results. So an example of which if you run a search for, for something, you get a set of results back. If the vast majority of users click on result number two, eventually that will become result number one. And so it is, I guess, a form of machine learning. Um, but it's not machine learning in the way that a sort of regular machine learning algorithm would work. Um, it's I more think, really upvoting, uh, isn't it really? It's just humans upvoting results. I, I, I don't know. I was, I was wondering as Tom was describing it, like a, a common thing you have with search is you don't really know what people want to find and how they look for it and things like that. So I guess there's elements there that could be useful of, you know, you discover that, you call something one term, but people are actually looking for another term and the algorithm learns to adjust to that. And maybe over mm. time you just change your copy as well. But, um, and then maybe where people go after that kind of thing, it actually starts to help you decide the, the journey that people follow that sometimes you don't know to begin with that could be where it starts to help. But I'm not sure. How yeah. It, but. Yeah. So, uh, so typically when people talk about machine learning, they're talking more about things like neural networks where the, 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 the algorithms actually modify things um, quite dynamically. Uh, what I was talking about before is a very simple kind of mechanism, um, but it still can be quite effective. But for those things to work, um, you need to have decent volumes of queries coming into your site. Uh, because if you've got very, very low query volumes, um, number one, those kind of things are really easy to spam. Like you just, it just takes somebody to click on a result three times and suddenly like they've influenced the results and they don't want that to happen. Um, so it is a bit of a, it, it is a bit of a balancing act there. Um, 
um, other, um, search engines often give you some other tools that you can use as well, which aren't, aren't really machine learning, but they, I guess they have uh, you as a human element in the system where you could, you know, look at things like the, the search usage analytics to see, well, what are people searching for that they can't find? Um, and then you can review that fairly regularly and go, oh, they're searching for this word, which I don't have. I'm just going to put something in there to say that when somebody searches for, for this particular word, I'm going to map it to the word that I use. So mapping that sort of user language to what might be the technical term um, that, that gets used within the site. And that's another really, really good way of improving your search results. Um, um, but in terms of machine learning, I think for the kind of search that we're talking about, probably there's not a huge level of benefit there. Um, I mean, obviously search engines like Google use it all the time. They use so many factors, things like, you know, what's your location and, um, and, and because it knows your location, I'm going to push up results that are kind of near, near to you and all this other kind of stuff. Um, it's a sort of very, very sophisticated beast, but the only reason they can do that is because they've just got such huge amounts of data to base this, this learning off that you can actually learn something useful. I suppose that's a bit different yeah. to like the, the scope of like a Google search, a public Google search is very different to, I guess, a site search because a site search is just focusing on a very narrow subset of the internet really, isn't it? So yep. I guess um the the type of things that people will be searching on on a doc site for example even like a basic website will be very different to what they would typically put into google as a search result they probably already know when they go into your doc site an idea of what they want to find so they won't be doing a broad search they'll probably like going like in the case of you know the product i work on matrix they probably want to search on something like well you know I want some more information about assets and what they are and what they do. So they probably already have an idea of what they need. And a lot of that sort of broader search that Google's so great at refining down to really narrow results is already done for you because you're already oh. in the context of a site. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, th that's certainly true. And I think it's more true of very technical sites like a documentation site that people are much more likely to be, uh, looking for a, an answer to a fairly specific question when they do run a search as opposed to the more sort of information discovery kind of queries that you'll get where it's like, I don't really know what I'm looking for, but I just want to find out stuff on this topic. Um, I think, think that's um, certainly a lot less. Yeah, I'm sorry. Got, sorry for cutting you off there. I was thinking no. at, at the, while you were saying that I was thinking is, is search a way of, working around a bad information architecture on this website or do you really need to already have a pretty decent information architecture or structure to your site for the search to work well? Uh, so a search can work well with a poor information architecture, but it'll work better if you've got a good information architecture. So, um, I mean, probably the, the, the number one thing that you can do to get a good search is to just write your content well, you know, follow kind of those, these, the, the, the sort of best practice things that are out there, particularly some of the web best practices, like, you know, you don't use click here for links, for example, mm -hmm. because actually those words you use when you define a hyperlink are actually really, really good indicators of what that target piece of content is. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you've got a link, say matrix asset listing or something like that, and that's the link, the link text there, it's probably a very um, high probability that that page that you're going to go to is about those three words. Mm. Um, so search engines, if they've happened to find, so those are actually seen by search engine, a bit like a vote for that page, especially if they come from an external site. Right. Um, so the quality within, of your XREF text is, is actually more important than you might think for how yeah, they, it, web crawler or a search engine crawls your site i guess yeah because it's effective go ahead sorry. yeah it's effectively and it's effectively another type of metadata about the page that you're going to uh in a similar way to the text that you use for the title or the heading one for your page again it's seen as quite an important thing uh to describe in a very succinct way what that page is about um, so uh, if you happen to find a match in that particular part of the page then that page is going to get pushed up because because of that. It's just quality. Um, it's just, go ahead, Chris. No, a question I had there that is, is something that um, has always intrigued me, I think maybe most with relation to search is, which I think you were starting to get to there, was the aspect of 
handing from how people often arrive at your site, which is through an external search engine to then um, your own search. Um, is that something you've ever looked at as well? So, you know, you, you, can, you, can, you can finesse the experience once someone is on the documentation site, but how they get there in the first place is somewhat harder to control, although there are ways. Yeah. <laughs> and then transitioning between the two. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think a lot of the, the principles are the same. I mean, if you write a site that, that, um, that you can search well locally, it's also going to benefit your public um, presence as well. Um, uh, so, so, you know, sticking to those kind of principles is always going to, you know, have a better outcome. Um, I mean, obviously, when it comes to, you know, once they're in the site, as you say, you've got um, control over that. That's where that's where things like the metadata and so on that you tag your pages with really starts to come to play. Uh, because frankly, there's very little point in adding metadata to your page if you're just using a public search engine. Most search engines just ignore it. Um, I mean, I know, I, th I believe Google has got some kind of heuristics in place to try and make an assessment. Is the metadata that, that, that exists on this page actually relevant to the content of the page? Because obviously people used to um, really abuse metadata early on. You know, there were a lot mm. of very dodgy sites out there that were just, um, you know, they buy a domain, which was quite a normal domain. And then they'd have all these hidden metadata with just random keywords so that their page would come up in the, in the search results of Google. So that pretty much shut down metadata as being a useful thing, but within your own site, within your own site, you could really, um, you can actually get at a lot of value by having good quality metadata in there. Um, uh, because you know, you can, you can make your search results have really nice summaries on them or really enhance the search results with, you know, particular information, maybe, you know, presenting some of the tags or showing an icon when it's of this particular type or, or whatever, or using it for your faceted navigation. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of things that you can, uh, a lot of value you can get from metadata, but just don't, I guess, don't put metadata in there for the sake of putting it in there because it's not going to do anything really. You had a yeah, question, I've got a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to make this as concrete and actionable as possible for everybody. Ha have you, has anybody ever like uh, looked at search analytics and taken some kind of concrete action based on those analytics? Um, you know, we, we talk very abstractly a lot about strategies, but I just want to hear stories like, oh, hey, we looked at our analytics. We found that people were searching for X. So this is the action we took. Or, yeah. yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So I, I did give you that example before, just in an abstract sense about, um, you know, uh, looking at your analytics and you find, for example, that, uh, oh, a lot of people are searching for this word, but I'm actually using a different word on my site. Um, so um, you can then take an action. You can go, oh, um, I'm going to put something in place. So in Funnelback, there's a, f a feature called a synonym where you can map one word to another word, for example, or expand the query into a certain set of words. So for example, many years ago, I was working for a small government organization. Um, one of the things they happened to do was research into, um, uh, research into homicides was one of the things that this organization did. Um, and they actually ran a, a program of like capturing all the national statistics on that particular topic. Now it was pretty important work in terms of the work that this organization did. Um, and we found when we looked at the analytics that uh, a lot of people were actually searching for murder and not getting any results. So we actually punched that into, punched that into the search and lo and behold, we got four search results back and we'd like, whoa, we've got a lot more content on that. But we don't use, but the thing was that we didn't use the word murder. Murder is one of those sort of popularist terms that, you know, the media use all the time, but there's a lot of technical terms like homicide and femicide and, and so on that are actually the, the technical terms for that. So we just put a simple synonym in place that said, if somebody searches for the word murder, actually search for murder or homicide or manslaughter or whatever else. And immediately suddenly you're starting to get search results back um, for this topic. That's one example. Um, another example is that, um, okay, you might go into your search analytics and see, oh, a lot of people are searching for, I don't know, electric vehicles. Um, and you, and um, again, you go and punch that in, or you even just look at the term and go, oh, actually, we don't have any content on electric vehicles on our site. Um, so then you can go, well, should I be adding it? 
Um, or if you're in the case of like a government organization, say, say you're the, the country's environment department and um, somebody's searching for that on your site and you just don't, it's not part of your government department's remit to have that content on the site. So, um, but users don't know any different, you know, oh, environment, electric cars, same thing. So um, maybe it's the transport department's job for that. So what you can do in that case is either go, well, I'm going to add some content on this so that people find something useful. Um, or again, Funnelback's got this feature where you can kind of do a featured result. And I, I believe other search engines have similar sorts of things. So what we did there, um, and in the context of a government site, you don't have this situation where you necessarily want to keep people trapped on your website. Uh, your goal as a government department is to help people find the information that they need to find out. So what we did is we put this thing, um, which is like a featured result on the site so that when people search, search for electric car, it would say, hey, this is where you can go, at, go to find information on electric cars. It's on the Department of Transport's website or whatever. Um, so people, yeah, they don't stay on your site, but at least they're not leaving your site being really annoyed at you because they couldn't find what the information they thought that you had. Um, so yeah, that's a couple of examples of how you can sort of, you know, use your web analytics to, to, to kind of improve things. Um, actually, there's a blog post that I wrote a few years ago about this particular topic that sort of goes through some of these examples that I've just given. Um, Thanks. And just yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, we'll link that yeah, in the um, show notes for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it goes through a few sort of fairly basic tips. It is it is slanted a little bit towards the funnel back product because that's what it was written for. But the 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 gist of the the advice you know kind of applies to anything, really. And it's kind of things like you know look for queries in there that you think oh, yeah we don't have that content. Let's direct people to where where it is. Or things like oh people are actually always searching for this word and they're always misspelling it. Well, actually, rather than returning a spelling suggestion that says, oh, did you mean to search for, you know, organization with an S in it or, you know, or government with like without an N in it because they're not great spellers. You can just go, well, if somebody searches for government without an N in it, I'm just going to search for government anyway. And then they get the results that they want because it's totally unambiguous what it is they're searching for. Mm. So, so far, I think I've heard a couple of takeaways that we've sort of been talking about. It seems that I'm making very big notes here. As always, I, I'm starting with a new project where I get to redo everything. And um, it search has is a no good place to start at the bottom. So <laughs> yeah, for sure. So it sounds like when you're building out your meta, because you said, Peter, that the importance of metadata can't be understated in your, your search. Um, but imagine there's a bit of a, a process to actually working out where to start with actually setting mm. up a metadata strategy for, for search. Um, I wonder if we could maybe think about some basic steps that people could take when they're like saying Chris's case, where he's just at the, at the ground level of his docs and he's goes, well, I know that search is important. I know I want to put search on the site, but how am I going to tell my search engine? the things I want it to know about. How will I know, how can I tell sure. it what to crawl, when to crawl? And it doesn't need to be, I mean, this is a pretty complex topic as we talked about offline. Okay. Maybe breaking it down to like, how would you go about just doing a basic level of metadata that would really help bring really nice quality results back in a search? Yeah, okay. So there's kind of two things we're talking about here. One of them is about sort of in-page metadata, which you can use to enhance your search results. But for that, you need to make sure you have a tool that supports those sorts of things. So, you know, if you want to present faceted navigation based off metadata, you need a search tool that will be able to do that. Um, the other side of uh, what Jared just brought up was some of the other things that you can do um, to tell web crawlers about your website. So um, maybe I'll quickly talk about that first. That's because, probably a good starting uh, point. A, yeah, let's, let's start we, there. We, yeah. That's something that anybody with a website can do. So um, there's a few things that web technologies actually provide to you as a web, uh, uh, an owner of a website. Um, uh, one of them is your robots.txt file. Uh, so uh, if you don't know what a robots.txt file is, it's basically a special um, text file that sits on your web server that a, um, a web robot, like a web crawler, like the Google bot or whatever, goes and visits and they can find out some information about your site. You can tell, um, you can tell these web crawlers or tell specific web crawlers, I don't want you to crawl these bits of my site, for example. 
Um, now your robots.txt operates on the whole of your website. Um, so you can say, oh yeah, I want all, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for you guys to crawl my site, but I don't want you to crawl, I don't know, my private section. They might have a folder called slash private or something. Or maybe calendars, um, for example. So, or, yeah. yeah, so a web crawler that sees that, and, and most web crawlers are well-behaved, will go, okay, I'll follow these rules, I'll index the site, but I'm going to, if I find a URL with calendar in it, I'm just going to ignore it. So mm. it doesn't end up in the index. So at a very high level, you can already start to exclude some stuff from the site. Now, the one thing to keep in mind, though, is that a web crawler is a bit like somebody opening up a web page and then clicking on all the links. So if you tell a web crawler to ignore a page um, and don't follow that link, if you then need to go to that next page to get to another page, it's not going to find it. So, so for example, um, if you um, want to, you don't want to index your website's homepage, but you want to index pages within the site, just as an example, uh, but you couldn't put that into your robots.txt because the web robot would say, oh, it says don't index the homepage. I'm just going to go away now. I'm not going to click on any of the links. So um, to get over that, there's a, a special metadata tag called the robots metadata tag, which you can put at a page level and tell your tell crawlers what to do. Um, and these these robots metadata tags, you can tell you can basically give combinations of index this page, don't index this page, follow links in this page, don't follow links in this page. There are a few other things as well, but those are the ones that are really of interest to us here from search point of view. Mm. Um, so if you say something like um, put this meta tag in that says no index follow, a web crawler will come in and go, oh, I'm not supposed to index the content on this page, but I'm still going to click on all of the links and then I'll go to that next page. And you can have a robots text, uh, sorry, a robots metadata entry in there as well that might say, oh, index all of the content on this page, but don't follow any of the links because maybe it's the landing page of a calendar or something. Um, and calendars are really bad for search engines because they often go infinitely in both directions. Um, so if you right. can imagine somebody clicking, you know, it's <laughs> called, a, it's called a crawler trap. Um, and most web crawlers have some, something in their algorithm to identify one, but you know, you might crawl 10,000 pages from the calendar before you trigger that switch. So it, it's always good practice to prevent that sort of stuff. So you've got so that's robots. The page. You've got yeah. robots and, and robots metadata. They're the two things you can do right now on your site to help. Yep. Um, Google and all the search um, providers out there to understand your site better. And that's yep. free. You um, can do it now. <laughs> it's free. It's just part of the, part of the web standards. Um, if, yeah, if you're interested in the robot stuff, look up the robots.txt information. You can actually do it from a, from a link level as well. Uh, and you can also do it by sending um, HTTP headers. So there's various options to give you the same kind of effect. Uh, the other thing that you can do in terms of web te technologies is to use a sitemap file as well. And sitemap files allow you to tell web crawlers, hey, I've got all these pages, maybe they're not even linked to, but I want you to index them. Uh, and you can also specify some things like, I want you to crawl this page ideally this, this, this often. So this content only changes, you know, don't crawl this more than once a week. Um, it's not going to guarantee that they're going to crawl you more frequently, but it'll it'll tell them to not sort of hit your site so frequently, or you don't need to check back very often because it doesn't change. Oh, that's some really good tips. Yeah, it's worth so noting that, for for anyone thinking this might sound like a lot of work that most most tools, open source and proprietary static site generators and all these other things usually do this for by default or have a very easy to configure plugin that will do it for you. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hey, no, exactly. I've, I've got a, I got a question, Peter. So, um, I've noticed that uh, Google has started to sort of uh, select parts of a page that try to answer the question I was asking, and then they present that selection as like micro content and the results. How do I tell Google that my page is a documentation page, and so that it will, I don't know, increase its rank in in among the many other different types of many other types of pages on Google, uh, like I want Google to know that it's specifically a documentation page that's helped yeah. content. Yeah, so that's a good point. So there, there are a bunch of other web standards that exist out there that um, can um, tell things like Google um, um, things about a page. Um, you've got a number of standards like the microdata standard, for example, where you can say this thing in a page 
this bit of the page constitutes an entity of something. Um, this entity might be, this might be about a person or whatever. This is how it starts to get those sort of rich snippets happening. Um, and, you know, sometimes a page might include multiple sorts of entities um, within them. So that's a standard called microdata. Then there's a few different variants of that. So there's another standard variant of that called um, RDF, which again is all about sort of tagging up specific things. It's all hidden stuff within the page generally. Uh, so it's a little bit like in-page metadata and actually some of it is in-page metadata. So um, for example, um, you know, when you share a page on Facebook, um, um, some pages that you share will come up with a nice rich snippet when you share them. Mm. Now that's because there's a certain set of metadata tags um, that tell Facebook, this is what the link of my page is. This is what the, what you should dis display as the thumbnail image. These are the, um, and this is what you should display as the description, for example. And those are the, um, the open graph metadata tags. So, um, there is some metadata that is totally worth putting into your pages if you think that it's going to help. Um, you know, if you think your pages are going to be shared, for example, that's a great thing that you can do as well. But um, support for this kind of stuff is very sort of variable from, from product to product. Um, um, so probably starting with things like those sort of open graph tags or the Twitter tags, um, and these are specific metadata tags, uh, is a good place to start. I wonder if um, the quality of your procedural titles also helps in that as well. Like I can imagine in a procedures title, you, if you were say wanting to search for how do I configure my labels in Gmail, you would expect that if uh, a procedure um, that comes up in a Google search had a lot of those matching keywords in the title, that would presumably rank it up higher in the search results as well. And it sounds like that, that content quality that you were talking about earlier about paying attention to how you write and how you structure mm. might also play a, a role in this as well. It, it wouldn't surprise me if that's the case. I mean, um, there's a, there's a lot of cues and things that um, search engines do take from a page. And, and of course, Google and some of the large search engines, they've also got the machine learning in there as well. Mm. Um, and when you start to extrapolate this across vast amounts of content, you can start to see patterns. So these how to's and so on, you can kind of go, Oh, it says how to, therefore I think I'm going to tag it as, as, as a, an FAQ, for example. Right. Um, so, but, but they, these are the kinds of things you do need fast amounts of data to be able to effectively sort of automatically tag if that's how you want to think about it. It sounds like you're best not to bank, bank the farm essentially on, on doing, putting certain keywords in, in your documents, just to try and affect yeah. the search engine. It comes down to just write well and write for your audience and make it, you know, yeah. make the content meaningful. I think if that's the one take one takeaway message that you have, yeah, write your content um, well and succinctly, um, and follow all of the best practice rules, and and your your that will immediately help your your site rank well, um, and avoid things like JavaScript as well. So, uh, one one common problem that we see is if you've got a very heavily JavaScript driven site, and for example, if it like an Angular type site, that's a bit like a web app. Uh, you'll find that most web crawlers will not be able to index them because they don't know how to run the JavaScript. So that that's another thing to avoid when you're looking at sort of technologies. Um, Is that still true? Uh, I sort of felt like maybe that must have been solved. <laughs> it hasn't really been solved. Um, mm. Google do have a queue um, for pages that it identifies as being JavaScript driven and, and it will try to crawl them. Uh, mm. But it crawls them at a much lower frequency. Um, and sometimes it just gives up or can't deal with it because effectively, mm. um, you, you know, the model becomes very um, broken down and you simulating clicks on things because yeah, it becomes very, very yeah. difficult. I'm a big fan of using tabbed um, output. Now I'm wondering if, uh, <laughs> if I should. <laughs> tab, yeah. tab, tabbed output isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, if you look at the yeah. HTML underlies, it is actually just yeah. like first tab, second tab. Yeah. Yeah. yeah true, so, true, 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 true. Yeah. But check the HTML. <laughs> it sounds like it's more affected by like progressive web apps and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, like yeah. A site that yeah just, it was a, the hash links. Um, yeah. And instantly. Yeah. And they become so popular. I just assumed that maybe Google had started figuring it out, but um, 
it, yeah. it does a little bit, but it's certainly not mm. um, not widespread. They're even promoted by other departments within Google itself. So. <laughs> Maybe it's interesting. I wonder if um, I wonder if focusing on stuff like accessibility helps with um, with searching and the ability for things to you know discover content on your site like web crawlers. Mm. Oh, yeah, it's, I think it's definitely, definitely, yeah. 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 It, it actually, uh, you know me, I like automated stuff. I came across, um, I have to uh, remind myself what it was called, but there's a, a great automating tool for checking this stuff. I think, pa, pa, I always forget how to pronounce the, the way it is, but the PA1111, PA11Y, I think is the one I came across that does a lot of automated checking for you. Oh, and right. um, I'm looking to... Uh, to convert that to some kind of uh, text editor extension at some point, <laughs> but it's quite useful. Yeah, no, look, anything that you can do that makes the site easier for people to use is going to help a search engine as well. So yeah, totally accessibility stuff. Um, I mean, you could even go down to the level, for example, of making use of things like acronym tags in, in HTML to expand out your acronyms. Like that stuff all helps people. Um, and it means that, I mean, the search engine will see that when it's indexing the page, so. Um, and imagine things like heading levels are pretty important in sites as well, like having those correctly nested and not sort of you know, like heading one to heading four and, you know, that sort of stuff, you know, it would help um, a, I, a crawler traverse a page. I think, yeah, as certainly all of that stuff helps as well. Um, I know for, for certainly heading ones get ranked quite highly. As you start to drop down the levels, it's probably less of an effect. Mm. And that would totally vary from search engine to search engine. For sure. Yeah. Well, I can't believe it, but we're actually already at our allotted time. This has been an incredibly interesting chat with you today, Peter. I just wanted to invite Tom or Chris, if you've got any last questions for um, yeah, Chris, go ahead if you got some. No, I let Tom go first. I do, but right. I let Tom go first. Tom, and I, I, I'm just like 10, 10 ounces away from uh, s complete sleep, so I'm out of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't, I'm not even coherent <laughs> anymore. <laughs> this is how I feel. Sorry, that the, 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 the call becomes a little bit hypnotic after a certain point. <laughs> I start just kind of like, yeah, that's how I usually feel. <laughs> yeah. How about um, you, Chris? I wanted to to ask. Um, we've mentioned one predominantly um, as I've mostly worked on open source projects fed out of static site generators I've usually in the past used um, Luna um, which is has its positives and negatives but apart from things like Luna Google um, Algolia are there any other good options for docs that we haven't covered in terms of tooling that we should maybe mention that's a good question. Um, I'm a, a, a little bit out of the seat on all of the actual available free things that are around these days. Um, uh, certainly, I know there are a lot of people that use tools like Elastic, um, yeah, Elasticsearch to do things, or Elasticsearch with, um, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Um, um, I, I, yeah, yeah, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, not really. Uh, I'm not actually sure. It's one of those things that I guess uh, it's a matter of really researching what's out there and yeah. um, and, and yeah. seeing what they can do. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. I can't be more helpful. No, it's fine. That. I hadn't actually, I mean, it's bizarre. I used to use Elasticsearch and the precursor to it. Um, oh, it's, uh, I can't remember what it's called. It's an Apache project. Um, and they do take a lot of configuration. Uh, Luna is very easy, but some of the stuff you mentioned about returning incorrect and, un and not useful terms is something I've definitely hit with it at certain points. It depends how our static site generators implemented it. So be a little wary of it. It's quick and easy and free, but it's not necessarily going to get you the best results out of the box. So. I guess it comes down to you'll get something out of it though. So if it's easy to switch true, on true, your true. site, then absolutely go for it and yeah. throw it in and yeah. see, like it could be the starting point of, you know, further investigations for you. So, you know, yeah. switch, switch yeah. the configuration flag on and let it do its thing and see what it does for you. Right. Yeah. yeah. What's the worst that can happen? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You'll return something. Yeah. It's, it's good. All right. Well, um, I think we might um, wrap it up there for, um, for this session, episode uh, 31 of Write the Docs podcast. So um, thanks again for coming on um, and uh, having a chat with us about all things search, Peter. It's been great having you today. 
Oh, you're welcome. I just hope everyone finds at least something to take away. Oh, I'm sure we will. Yeah, it should be interesting to see the comments we get from this one because I think search is one of those things that people have so many questions about, but they don't don't know what those questions are until they don't know until they know what they don't know. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, thanks again for coming on. It's been great. So um, you're most welcome. So for um, people who um, listen to the show regularly, you'll, you'll know this already, but for, if this is your first time listening to Write the Docs podcast, you'll know that uh, you won't know that you can actually find all of the episodes um, for um, past episodes for the people like Peter who have come on uh, at uh, podcast.writethedocs.org. That'll get you into the, the Write the Docs website and we'll jump links to it. Um, if you like what you heard on the show, if you've got any other follow-up questions, do jump on to the Write the Docs Slack into the podcast channel and um, get in touch with us because we love to hear when people have actually uh, got some value out of the show. So um, jump on in or leave a comment on YouTube or your local, uh, your favorite podcasting app, whatever you like to use to listen to the show. It'd be great to get your feedback. Um, but uh, I guess until we meet again, it's... Uh, the, I have to say it, it's docs or it didn't happen. Have a great uh, time, everyone, until we meet again. <laughs>